people around him were thinking, gee, some of these things that he believes are kind of strange. But nobody thought, you know, is he going to kill his kids? That was never on anybody's radar. Hey guys, welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be looking into a case that's relatively new compared to the other cases I've covered, and it only happened a little bit more than a year ago. And unfortunately, it's extremely devastating to say the least. So actually, before we jump into the video, I do just want to put a little bit of a forewarning that if you're not interested in learning about a case that involves the murder of two young toddlers, then I would skip this video because that is what this case involves. Although I'm not going to be going too heavily into the graphic details of the case, I did just want to put out that forewarning before we jumped into it. This case is a crazy one with a couple of conspiracy theories, so definitely buckle up. If you are interested in things like true crime, crazy and unknown historical events, ghost phenomena, and things of that sort, then you have stumbled on the right channel because that is all I'm going to be talking about here. And I am going to try to post regularly. I know I say that in every video but a lot of things are going on in my life right now. As you can see, I have a new background because I just moved. But instead of me rambling on and on, let's go ahead and get into the video. I couldn't find much about Matthew's early years, but leading up to the murders, Matthew was your typical father living the California lifestyle in Santa Barbara, California. And you could say that he was living the California dream because he had his own surf school, and he also taught Spanish at a local private school. And actually, one of my friends who told me to look into this case had him as a teacher at that school, and she said that if anyone was to commit this crime, he would have been the last person that she would have suspected, because he just seemed so genuine and down-to-earth with his students. On the morning of Saturday, August 7th, 2021, Matthew Coleman and his wife, Abby Coleman, were packing up their van for a family camping trip that they had coming up soon. And when Abby came out to the driveway with some materials that they wanted to put in the car, she noticed that Matthew, the toddlers, and the van were gone. And at first, she wasn't too concerned. She just thought that Matthew might have run out to get some materials for their camping trip and was going to be right back after their errands. It wasn't until she went into the house and noticed that the car seats for the toddlers were still there and that's when she got very concerned and started trying to call and text Matthew to no avail, and for hours he was not responding. So after hours of no response from her husband, she went to police to file a missing persons report. While police were questioning Abby, trying to get to the bottom of whatever was going on, they asked her to pull up Find My iPhone to try to track Matthew's whereabouts that way. And when his phone pinged, it was showing that he was in Rosarito, Mexico, which, when the police got this information, they were very concerned and they got the FBI and Border Patrol involved because to them this seemed like a potential parental kidnapping going across national lines, which was very worrisome. And in cases like that, it's very time sensitive. And so they knew they had to act fast. A few hours after Abby filed the police report, Matthew finally responded to her text messages and basically was just saying that he loved and missed Abby and also said that he has been really confused lately and just needed to be alone to have some clarity. And that already with the couple of hours being away, he's already started to gain some clarity. And so to Abby, these messages weren't too concerning. I did not see if she told police right away that he finally reached out because it's my knowledge that the FBI and Border Patrol continued looking for him, so I'm not too sure on that. But one thing that was a little concerning to me in those messages was he was mentioning that he believed that family and friends were chipping their conversations and recording them. For what reason, I'm not too sure, but he did state that he believed that people were conspiring against him. In a statement that was later given to police by Matthew, he stated that in the nights leading up to the murders, he would lie awake in bed at night and claimed that the pieces of the puzzle were floating in front of him and he was able to decipher the codes, kind of like the Matrix, and he would be Neo. But the only thing that this really told police was what his mental state was like in the days leading up to the murders. 
On Monday afternoon, so now two days after the missing persons report was filed, Matthew crossed over the border, and when he did so, the Border Patrol asked their normal security questions, asked for his identification, and when their system pinged that they needed more information from him, they asked him to pull over to secondary. If you've never been across the border, or you've been lucky enough to not be pulled into secondary and you don't know what it is, it's essentially exactly what it sounds like, and it's a second place that the Border Patrol can pull you over to if they feel like they need to search your vehicle or ask you more questions. And basically they can just spend as much time as they want with you over there without holding up the main line that's funneling through the border. <laughs> oh boy, do I have so many stories of going across the border and being pulled into secondary every single time. But that is a story for another time, I guess. At the end of the day, I think it is a good thing that they do that extra security step if they need to, because it is ensuring that everyone coming over the border is safe to enter. And in this case, with Matthew, it worked exactly how it was supposed to because they were able to detain him at the border. He's accused of murdering his two toddlers. Their bodies were found on a ranch south of Rosarito. The suspect, a father from Santa Barbara, is in custody here in the U.S. News 8's Richard Allen joins us from the San Ysidro border crossing tonight with the very latest. Richard. Well, that's right. It was here at the San Ysidro border crossing Monday morning that 40 year old Matthew Taylor Coleman was arrested as he tried crossing from Mexico into the United States just hours after his two young children, a three year old boy and one year old girl were discovered stabbed to death. Authorities arrested Coleman at the border on suspicion of murder. Leading up to Coleman's arrest, Santa Barbara police confirmed that Coleman's wife had reported her husband and her two young children missing, saying she was concerned for their well-being. According to a statement from the FBI, Coleman remains in federal custody, while a joint investigation continues among federal investigators in Los Angeles and San Diego, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and Mexican authorities. And authorities on both sides of the border are now working to return the bodies of the two children here to California. In the meantime, Coleman could face extradition to Mexico to face murder charges, and if ultimately convicted, could spend at least the next 60 years in a Mexican prison. While Matthew was in secondary, the Border Patrol asked him what they needed to ask, although it's not known what they asked. However, what is known is that... It worried them a lot that he was the only person in the car, and knowing that this was a potential parental kidnapping, they asked him to exit the vehicle so they could search it, and that's when they discovered quite a bit of blood in the trunk of the vehicle. So they started asking him where the kids were, and according to some articles, he played dumb for a little bit before divulging what he had done, and other articles state that he confessed immediately to the crime. At the same time that Matthew was being questioned at the border, a farmer was in Rosarito and he noticed some piles of brush on his farm, so he went over to investigate it, and that's when he found the bodies of the two toddlers and he called authorities immediately. In his confession, Matthew claimed that he knew what he was doing was wrong, However, he believed that by murdering his kids, he was in return saving the world. Like me, you're probably wondering how the hell the murder of his kids is correlated with the Earth being saved. But according to Matthew, he believed that his kids had serpent DNA, which was passed on to them by their mother. And if he didn't do anything fast, then they would eventually grow up to be monsters and ravage the world. Although it's not fully confirmed, it is believed that this conspiracy about serpent blood or serpent DNA is derived from the conspiracy theory that's a little bit more well known about lizard people. And if you don't know that conspiracy, it's basically a conspiracy that states that lizard people have infiltrated our society here in America, and they've done so by working their way into politics or the banking system or even Hollywood elites and they have disguised themselves so they can walk amongst us as one of us. According to Matthew, he first learned about this serpent DNA conspiracy through his hours of research into QAnon. If you don't know what QAnon is, the simple answer to that is they are an anonymous entity that purports conspiracy theories some of them being 
well known and others being less known, mostly surrounding the government, but more specifically they surround the Democratic Party. You may have seen QAnon in action during the 2020 elections spreading misinformation, but the most notable conspiracy theory during 2020 was the fact that the Democratic Party is a group of Satan worshippers that kidnap and drink babies' blood, or something like that. Matthew would spend hours a day on forums pertaining to QAnon conspiracies, even stating in his confession that his wife Abby was falling victim to these conspiracies as well, reading them beside him. However, according to Abby, she definitely was believing some of the things that they were reading in the sense that she couldn't prove them right or wrong. However, she noticed that Matthew was spiraling way deeper into the conspiracies than she was. Matthew also explained that in the six days leading up to the murders, he was noticing very subtle but strange coincidences, claiming that he believed that QAnon themselves were communicating with him directly. During some of the interviews, Matthew stated that he believed that more and more people were becoming part of the conspiracy, believing that certain hand gestures proved that they had pledged their allegiance to, I'm assuming, the lizard people, even stating that a simple hand gesture of the peace symbol was proof that they had pledged their allegiance to them. Friends that were close to Matthew even noticed a huge shift in his behavior in the months and weeks leading up to the murders, but in interviews with all of them, they all stated that they never believed that he would be capable of harming his kids in any way. After Matthew had taken the kids and drove down to Mexico, the trio checked into the City Express Hotel in Rosarito, and that's where they stayed for the two days leading up to the murders. However, it's not really known what they did while they were there, because out of the two days, there was only one person that came forward to the police stating that they remember seeing them there, and that was because they stood out to her because they were all three good looking. And also in this woman's statement, she remembers thinking that she didn't know where the mom was, but believed that she was somewhere on the property, either at the beach or the pool, because at one point she overheard Matthew say to the kids, you will see mommy soon. And so to her, nothing was out of the ordinary, but from what we know now, the mom was nowhere on the property and she was a couple hundred miles away in her Santa Barbara home, trying to find out what was going on with her kids. After checking out of the hotel, Matthew drove the kids to a nearby ranch, which was only a couple minutes away from the hotel and it's not really clear what happened in the next couple of moments. What we do know is that Matthew stabbed each of his toddlers a dozen times each with a spear gun, and then discarded their bodies and covered them with brush, and continued on his way to the United States border. Matthew was charged with two counts of foreign first-degree murder of U.S. nationals. However, he has pleaded not guilty to the charges. Now, over a year has gone by since the murders occurred, and the Justice Department is still determining whether they want to seek the death penalty or not on this case, which has delayed any possible trial from occurring. However, an update was obtained by Vice News, and it said that there is some sort of update coming soon in October pertaining to this case. So I'm going to stay eyes glued on it and see what's going on in this case, and if there's any updates, I could possibly do an update video on this. For the meantime, however, Matthew is being held in jail without bail. In late May of this year, a friend of Matthew's received a letter from him in jail, and in this letter it states that he is using God's help to realize that he was extremely far from the truth, also claiming that he is using his free time in prison to sort through all of the circumstances, claiming that there is a lot to unpack, and he finished off the letter by begging forgiveness from this friend, but claims that he knows that he's in the right place now. I wasn't able to find any responses to the letter from that friend, so I'm not too sure if he gave Matthew his forgiveness or if they're staying in contact or anything like that. 
However, I did find multiple interviews from friends that are staying very supportive of him. To me, that's an answer that they were able to find forgiveness for his actions. Not that his actions were done to hurt them, but it seems like they are staying very supportive of Matthew during this time. In the years since the murders, Abby has stayed relatively quiet, and she actually has never spoken publicly about the tragic events that unfolded. And shortly after everything settled in Santa Barbara, she did pick up everything and move to Texas so she could be close to family. And according to a family friend, that is where she has been ever since. Like I mentioned towards the beginning of the video, there were some text messages that were sent between Abby and Matthew in the hours leading up to the murders. And one message in particular is giving Abby a bad reputation because of the wording. And that message says this. We are doing this together, babe. Praying for clarity over you and your mind this morning. Everything you've believed and known to be true is happening right now. I'm partnering with you from Santa Barbara. Let's take back our city. The gateway of revival for the state of California and the nation and the world. You were created to change the course of world history. Take care of my little giant slayer and my voice of heaven's dove. They sure are special. So with the peculiar wording of that message, along with the later revelation of Abby being part of the research of QAnon, has made lots of people speculate that she is more involved than she's making it seem. However, there are family members that have spoken out against this accusation, stating that she was just being a supportive wife for her husband who was going through a really hard time. And honestly, I can see both sides to it. There's definitely some words in that text message that seem a little concerning, for sure. But I also can see the concerned wife that wants to take care of her husband and make sure that he's doing okay. Many people that were close to the Colemans believe that Abby may have been next because in confessions from Matthew, he has made it clear that he believed that the serpent DNA came from her. And he has also confessed that he believed his wife was possibly a shapeshifter. To me, it seems like he's referring to the lizard people conspiracy with that statement in the sense that they were able to shapeshift into a disguise so we weren't able to notice them infiltrating our society. But I'm honestly not too sure what he meant by the shapeshifter aspect of it. As of now, though, that is all I was able to find on this case. However, like I mentioned, there is supposed to be an update in the next month, so it should be interesting to see where this case is going. Some people in the community of Santa Barbara believe that others had to be involved with the radicalization of Matthew, and honestly, with this trial coming closer and closer, only time will tell if others were involved in this or if Matthew completely acted alone. Personally, I don't think any particular person can be blamed for this other than Matthew himself. I mean, he confessed that he knew what he was doing was wrong from the get-go, and although he's pleading not guilty, but at the end of the day, he is going to have to face the consequences of his actions. And through the letters that he has sent out in jail, it is pretty apparent that he's reeling from those actions. I also believe that Abby is telling the truth in regards to how much she knew prior to the crime unfolding. Because for the sole fact that she was very open to what was going on leading up to the murders, including the fact that she was researching QAnon with her husband, which does kind of implement her to look worse than she is. But what do you think? Definitely leave a comment down below to show your thoughts on this case, and also put a like on the video to show that you want me to do an update on the trial once it wraps up, because it definitely seems like a trial is closely approaching. But other than that, that is going to be it for me today. If you did like today's video and you want to see more of my uploads, definitely consider hitting the subscribe button so you don't miss a future upload. But as always, I do appreciate any and all support, and I will see you on my next upload.